X-Wing 2nd Edition is officially here, and that means there are some changes between 1st and 2nd. And we're going to cover all of them in this video. Hopefully all of them. Well, at least most of them. Most I had, of them. I had a chance to play against Alex. That's another video we've done. Uh, and he reveals some more rules as we play, which is <laughs> good for him. It's very convenient, isn't it? Uh, but we also, I sat down with all three co-designers for an episode of the podcast. We have a lot more coverage coming. So we put all that together in a single blog. And you can find a link to that blog in the description of this video. And if you like the changes that you see and you want to upgrade some or all of your ships to the second edition of X-Wing, we can help you out there. We have core sets and conversion kits ready to go on our store. And they're currently shipping for free, so you can find those there. We also have subscriptions for every single faction that is now defined in the game. So if you just want to get certain faction ships automatically as soon as they release, we can help you out there too, starting with Wave 1. And it's important to note, all the factions are basically self-contained. So if you buy all the Imperial ships, you'll get all the stuff you can use for Imperial, which is different than First Edition. One of my edition. favorite changes. One of my favorite changes. So enjoy. We'll be covering top to bottom all the rules changes for Star Wars X-Wing 2nd Edition. Hello everyone and welcome. X-Wing 2nd Edition is here and I'm joined by Alex Davey, one of the co-designers, and we're going to be going through step-by-step -step every change in X-Wing 2. Heck yeah. Happy to be here. H how are you feeling at this point? Oh, I'm so excited. This is uh, the culmination of pretty much five years of Frank and I batting around ideas for how to tweak the game, how to refine things, things we wish we could do. And they let us do pretty much everything we wanted. So that's awesome. Uh, so basically, you came in as a developer on like wave four ish? Yep, wave four. Yep. Frank came in slightly before me uh, in the um, Rebel Transport expansion. Uh, and then Frank and I worked with James Niffen on wave four. And then we took over the line. And then Max came in around wave nine. Excellent. So lots so, of experience getting to totally redo this. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest changes, one of the things I'm most excited about is the addition of a new mechanic uh, called the Force. So yes. uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about the Force and where that came from and how it works. Well, one of the big th things that we wanted to do uh, for X-Wing was somehow represent that because it hadn't really uh, come across very clearly in first edition. We had certain abilities that were maybe referencing that, but we didn't have a definitive mechanic. Um, so we wanted to make Force users feel special, make it feel like the Force has an influence not only on the galaxy, but on specific things in the game. Um, but we also didn't want to make it too complicated, too difficult to understand. Um, early on, we played around with adding a new die. Uh, we decided that was a little bit too cumbersome. So I think we ended up with a really elegant, simple mechanic that fits right into what already exists in the game. Um, in first edition, a lot of the things that we were doing to represent the Force um, revolved around the focus action. So that was kind of our, our thought, like, well, the Force lets you focus more. If you're in tune with the Force, you can manipulate that kind of thing. So a lot of the, the sort of uh, Force using characters in first edition had references to that. Luke would be able to, you know, change focus results to evades on defense. You know, Kane and Jarrus was able to uh, manipulate stuff like that, yeah. add, add or remove defense dice, things like that. So we decided to just make it concrete. And so it's very simple. Um, force users have a force rating on their card, which is this purple number. Uh, and basically, they can spend one of these force points flipping it over from its purple side to its red side to change a focus result into uh, either a hit on offense or an evade on defense. So they still functionally work a little bit like focus. Yeah, they're like little mini focuses. And it's a very powerful ability, obviously, because you know even if you lose your action or do a red maneuver and, you still and can't aren't perform it. Exactly. Flying in the wind there. Yeah, and, and that force rating goes up and down depending on your capabilities. Luke, as we have depicted him, he's you know New Hope Luke. He's just coming into his own, just learning his force powers. So he has a force rating of two, uh, but obviously he's a prodigy. So his mm -hmm. uh, pilot ability is that whenever he becomes the defender, so whenever he gets attacked, he gets to regenerate one of these force charges. So he is very uh, solid on the defense because he's going to be able to have a force charge uh, to defend himself from every attack. That's super thematic. You can't can't lock him down, kind of like in A New Hope, right? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And Vader, on the other hand, has a force rating of three. He's uh, an old master of the force. He's, he's been around for a long time. He has one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, pilot abilities in the game, which is to just do a second action. 
Now, uh, in first edition, this was just something he could do. Uh, in second edition, this cost him a force point. So you have this force rating, and at the end of every round, you regenerate one force point. So it's never going to go away completely, but if you're forced to continually spend it, uh, you won't have a chance to recover it back up, and then you're, then you're limited to a single uh, die modification per turn. Sure. So it's this sort of subtle thing where if, if Vader can break off from the fight, recover some force charges, uh, and come back into the fight, he will be at, at full power. But if he's forced to stay in the scrum, stay in the furball, he may only be getting to use one force charge a turn. So sure. part of your strategy is going to relate to can you keep pressure on these force users uh, prevent them from recovering their full their full potential. Sure. So it's a small it's a small uh, additional rule, but it adds a lot of strategy to the game. Very cool. Now, if you look at the pilot cards, and the next biggest change for me mm-hmm. is there's some things missing. So you added the four stat, yep. right? Uh, but we're also missing point costs and upgrade slots. Yep. So tell me about that. That's crazy. That's that may be the fundamentally biggest change in X Wing Second Edition. Yeah. Well, you know it it was something we've been talking about for a really, really long time. Um, one of the things that we've been doing throughout the years is to try to keep the game relevant, try to keep uh, ships as balanced as possible, um, keep old ships viable. Uh, but in first edition, the only real route we had to accomplish that was the addition of upgrade cards or you know titles or these sort of um, hot fixes that we had to hope would work um, if a ship came out and it was too strong, there wasn't a lot that we could do about it outside of a, a hard errata to the ship, and we certainly didn't want to do too much of that. So uh, the obvious simple solution to that is just have points costs that you can adjust uh, when you need to. Um, and that is not only good for the balance of the game, it's also good for the overall health and longevity of the game because that stuff is no longer fixed you know, in amber, permanently attached to the card, if it turns out that we miss the mark, we can tweak that along the, you know, later down the, down the line. So it, it, it helps a lot in terms of, is this game going to continue for years and years and years and, and remain viable? Uh, are older ships going to get outclassed by newer ships? No, they're not, because we can, we can adjust those levels. The other thing that we did is we took the upgrade icons off. One of the things that happened in first edition is we'd have great new ideas for upgrade icons or even obvious ideas for upgrade icons that you know didn't exist on older ships but should have. The biggest example of that is just the Y-Wing should have bombs. But <laughs> we, bombs were not invented until Wave 2. Sure. So the Y-Wing, a ship which canonically is a bomber, you see it on it's screen. It's like the main bomber on it's, the screen. It's perhaps yeah. the main bomber of the Rebel Alliance, uh, did not have access to that slot. Um, so by taking the upgrade icons off, one, it's another way we can balance the game, but two, if later down the line we come up with something really cool, or if something really cool comes out in Star Wars that we're like, oh, well, we didn't even realize this ship had this capability, but now it, now it does because of this comic book or this movie or whatever, we can add that icon in later and give these older ships access to it. So cool. it's about keeping things fresh, and I'm super excited about that ability. Yeah, it seems to make it a much more versatile environment. And even with the original edition, uh, you know, early on in the game, TIE Fighters were very good. They were very cost-effective. Yep. And then as the game went on, not as cost-effective. And exactly. just being able to adjust those points could be a really big deal. Okay, so looking at Vader uh, mm-hmm. in his stat card, the next thing I'm noticing is we have this like focus icon with an arrow to a red barrel roll, which signifies to me probably a stressful barrel roll, yep. which we haven't seen red actions. And what's the arrow all about? What's, what's that going on? Yeah, I'm glad you asked, because that's another mechanic that we're super excited about. So. Um, as you know, competitive players no doubt understand, uh, the card Push the Limit was one of the defining, if not the defining, upgrade of X-Wing First Edition. Um, basically, Push the Limit, for those who are not familiar with it, allowed uh, any ship that had the Elite Pilot Talent icon to equip this card, and after it performed an action, it was able to perform a second action at the cost of a stress. Hugely powerful. Hugely hard to control because every ship with an elite pilot icon, which is a very common icon, almost every ship in the game has it, had access to this card. And it caused all kinds of design problems, caused all kinds of balance problems, and mostly it caused a lot of identity problems, um, especially in tandem with upgrade cards that added uh, actions 
So any ship could equip engine upgrade, any ship could equip push the limit, lots of ships had barrel roll. So you had a lot of ships that ended up feeling very samey because they could all do the same thing. And that's bad for balance, and it's also bad for ship identity. Sure. But it's a super cool mechanic. Being able to take another action is a lot of fun. Being able to boost and then barrel roll, or barrel roll and then boost, or even just boost focus, or, or any, any sort of linked action is a lot of great design space. In order to keep that under control, and in order to give ships their own identity, we developed the concept, or actually I should say Frank developed the concept of these linked actions. Um, a linked action is exactly that. Uh, you see on that card there, it's got a little arrow. It's this, then this. Um, you have to perform it in sequence. But what it essentially means is, you know, the tie advanced can focus, and then if it wants to, it can perform a barrel roll. That barrel roll is red, so it'll generate a stress. Um, what that does is it allows us to do really cool, uh, cool things and give a lot of the ships that should have these kind of mini push the limit abilities. Um, the ability to do that, and it's a lot of great design space to play around in. The other thing is red actions. Red actions are really cool. Like, uh, the Y-Wing has a red barrel roll. So in a pinch, it can, it can do that, but it's not as nimble as an X-Wing or a TIE Fighter, so it's going to cause the pilot a little bit of stress. Uh, but just having that capability on its uh, action bar makes it a much more interesting ship. It gives it a little repositioning power. Um, it gives you another option to play around with, uh, and it's a cost. So between the two of those things, we can really finely tailor every single ship to have a very unique feel. And that's super exciting. And in the same vein, is there an intent to have each uh, faction in the game have their own identity, right? Where yes. Imperials seem to have barrel rolls here that are not red, uh, whereas maybe the Rebels get access to barrel in the red form. What, what's your thoughts on faction identity in second edition? Yeah, and we actually thought about this a lot uh, for second edition because um, in first edition the the lines kind of got blurred uh, the more content we produced the the more overlap there was between factions the the less um, kind of uh, individual identity each faction was able to have um, in second edition we really thought hard about what do these factions do what do they represent um, how do they play out? We looked at all the mechanics that we designed. We tried to, to put them into different categories. And what we, com what we came up with is um, essentially the Rebels are uh, team players. They've got the buddy system going on. Uh, they like to help each other, but they like to help individual ships. You know, like I, my wingmate and I are going to help each other out. I'm going to pass you a focus. You're going to pass me a target lock. We're going to coordinate it's our like efforts. like Wedge and Luke working together to exactly. do the thing. Yeah, yeah the abilities like Garvin Drays or Dutch Vander. Um, essentially, pick a single friendly ship, make it better. Um, coordinate our actions. It's very uh, hero-centric, that kind of thing. Kind of like a squadron, like a rogue squadron. Exactly, squadron yeah, yeah. They're, they're talking to each other constantly. They've got their battle plans. They're, you know... Very cool. If one of them goes down, it's a, it's a, it's big. They're all friends. There's... Very few of them. It's it's very. It's not just intimate. another Tie Fighter getting blown up. Exactly. Like, That's my best friend over there. Yep. Uh, and the, in customizability is also key for the rebels. They have a lot of different icons, a lot of different ways that they can build their ships. Um, and it's a, a more elite faction. You're going to have fewer ships on the table versus the Imperials. Which makes sense. Uh, the Empire. You've got a lot of standard templates. Uh, one of the complaints in First Edition was that the Imperials missed out on a lot of the the cooler toys because. They just they don't have astromechs. They don't really use them. Uh, they don't have various uh, upgrade opportunities. So the one thing that we wanted to do for the Imperials is to focus on on swarm play, uh, getting a lot of ships on the table. Their stuff is cheaper, more fragile, uh, fewer shields. But expendable. But expendable. Um, but they also have advanced weapons projects, advanced R&D. Uh, they have cutting-edge starfighters. Uh, and the way that we have chosen to represent that is in another new mechanic, something called a ship ability. Um, this is like a pilot ability, but it applies to every ship of that chassis. And the Imperials have more ship abilities than any other faction in the game. Gotcha. So this is like a TIE Advanced. All the TIE Advanced gets this ability. Exactly. Yeah. If you look at uh, Darth Vader, you see he's got the Advanced Targeting Computer. So every TIE Advanced has that built into the ship. And so they all have this sort of unique way to play, they, they want to focus on getting target locks, zeroing in on one enemy fighter, doing critical hits. Um, TIE Interceptors have uh, the onboard auto thrusters ability, which lets them 
uh, do a red boost or barrel roll after any action they perform. Nice. So bringing that old school push the limit flavor to the interceptor. Uh, and, and in general, the, the uh, Imperials have access to um, many more of these sort of specialized fighters because that was kind of their um, manufacturing ethos. Very cool. So they have uh, mass ships and also highly customized, like, advanced technology. Yeah, and, but these ships, are, these ships are narrowly tailored for a specific role. It's like, this is our interceptor. We build um, a lot of them, but, and they're designed to do this and do this very well. They don't have the same flexibility that a Y-Wing does where you can build it as a bomber or as a torpedo ship or as a turret ship. But very cool. they're going to do their one thing super well. Scum, of course, dirty tricks. Scum, <laughs> scum is going to be always scummy. Very just scummy. scummy. Yeah, that, that's the easiest faction to have an identity for because it's just, you know, mercenaries, crazy abilities, uh, selfish pirates. You know, they're they're that's awesome. They don't necessarily work together. Exactly, but they also they're in it for themselves. They're, yeah, they're that's great for for dirty tricks. So another change um, that I'm very excited about uh, is. The change to turrets. Yes. So what has changed with turrets? I know in the in the first game, like the Millennium Falcon came out in Wave Two, mm -hmm. 360 turret, basically mm -hmm. at, you can shoot any direction all the time. Uh, how do turrets work in Second Edition? Well, they don't do that. Uh, <laughs> Two thumbs up. I, you know, one of the things that I think is so important when you are designing a revised edition of a game is you want to zero in on what works and what you know what is the heart of X Wing. To me, the heart of X-Wing is the guessing game. It's planning your maneuvers, it's trying to get enemy ships in arc, it's trying to guess what your opponent's gonna do and outwit and outplay them. Um, and unfortunately, a ship that can shoot 360 degrees really takes a lot of the maneuvering out of the game. Um, you can't really dodge that ship's firing arc. You can't really outplan it, you just, have to hope that when it shoots you, you don't go down. And so we tried all kinds of uh, patches to that mechanic in first edition, like auto thrusters, uh, ships that got advantages for being outside of the enemy firing arc, turret ships that got advantages for being in arc, just to try to encourage that kind of thing. But um, one mechanic that we came up with on the Shadowcaster was really popular, was the mobile firing arc. Um, basically, you can you can see that right here. It's here on the Y wing. You have essentially a turret indicator, and you can move that indicator into different quadrants. And every ship in the in every piece of punch in Second Edition has four unique quadrants, and therefore every single turret that we do in the game can function exactly like a mobile firing arc. So you can shoot in every direction, but you have to plan for it. And you have to, does it cost an action to move your turret? Yeah, it costs an action. Um, so rotating a firing arc, um, you'll see the, uh, the ion cannon turret. When you, when you buy this turret, you get the rotate arc action. Uh, you get the turret arc. You get the, its range and its power and, and, and what, what it does. does. So. Um, so if I'm playing the game, you know, I, I might start the game you know, with my turret to the side because I'm intending to like... You know, straight, strafe these TIE fighters, but later on I may have to spend an action to adjust it to my rear, and if my initiative is low, my opponent can see where my turret arc is and barrel roll out of arc, barrel roll out of arc or plan their dial accordingly. So it's much more tactical, but it still maintains the important consideration of the fact that there are turrets in Star sure. Wars. Because the Falcon has the, the Falcon turret guns that can shoot a turret gun. Yeah. And, and this has been really, really popular with our playtesters, and I think it's a, it's a really great change because it restores the maneuvering, arc-dodging tactics to the game that kind of get lost with the 360 turrets. One of the hallmarks of X-Wing. Yeah, exactly. So this, yeah. this was uh, really well-received on the Shadowcaster, and it was a pretty easy decision to just make it how it works. Across the line, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that one point brings up a number of things that are worth mentioning. So you're talking about the bases here. Now these look a, a, a good bit different mm -hmm. than the first editions. I see the bullseye arc marked on the base, which is yes. something we saw later in first edition. Um, tell me about the just the upgrade to the base design. Well, I like, I like everything about it, and I have to shout out to uh, Sean Boyk because his uh, graphic design is phenomenal. Like his take on second edition is really stripped down, really minimal. I think it looks gorgeous. And even more importantly for us as game designers, selfish beasts that we are, we have more tech space for abilities and we have all of these indications on every single piece of punch board for us to play around with. You can see that there are four zones clearly marked. So we can do things like the turret mechanic. Well, technically It'll, you have eight. 
Because yeah, that's the, true. Uh, there's a there's a four and an aft and a and a yeah. Uh, you got uh, the crisscross lines going on. There, <laughs> starboard, right? uh, and yeah, we we can like reinforce plays with that. Reinforce you can reinforce the the four or the aft, and so you have to choose you know which which zone is going to be protected. Sure. Um, there's various upgrades in the game where it's like if you're behind the enemy, and in first edition we couldn't really explain that, but now we can. It means if you're you know, yeah, because if, if a ship didn't in the, have in the rear a zone. line, because we had like the Ozotec gunship that had the line going across. Exactly. But not every ship had the line going across. Yep. So saying, you know, if you're behind the ship, it's like, well, you decide what's halfway. Exactly. There was nothing to indicate that. Um, and then the other thing is, yeah, you, you mentioned the uh, the bullseye arc. Uh, the bullseye arc is uh, a Max Brook invention that he debuted with the Kimogela. Um, actually, I think it was one of our... Um, one of our interns had that idea was the the, the line that would sort of uh, be uh, an extra the bonus. Bullseye, if, bullseye the bullseye, right. the bullseye, right. yeah. Um, and uh, Max was like, "That's a great idea. Let's put that into into the game." And we liked it so much, we decided to standardize it for the whole two yeah. yeah. Now, not every ship uses it, but there's uh, no in reason fact, not most, to have it. Right? Most don't, but many upgrade cards do, and every punch board has it so we can play around with it. Very cool. um, you see crack shot on there. That's a common upgrade card. Basically it it, it allows you to cancel one of the defender's uh, evade symbols if they're in your bullseye arc. So it represents you've you've got them dead to rights. So you can yeah. do that little extra bit of damage. Yeah and so that also brings me to the next thing which is the barrel roll changed. Mm -hmm. um, which you're able to do because of the new basis. So how does the new barrel roll work? Well one of the issues with barrel roll in first edition was that it would um, function quite radically differently depending on base size and particularly on large ships it was it was this huge amount of distance even turning the template on its side uh, and also even on small ships it, it gave you probably too much repositional power um, when we really started digging down and, and trying to figure it out um, in you know obviously in first edition you could put it anywhere on the base and then you could roll anywhere on the base. And so it was it was a, a pretty big margin on a small ship, but it was an incredibly big margin on a larger base size. But uh, in second edition, we've curtailed this a little bit. You still have repositional power, but it's not as dramatic. It's a little bit more balanced. Now you place the template with the uh, little hash mark there lining up with this center line. Which is another new addition. You've got these lines on these templates, right? Yes, yes, because uh, one of the, the real challenges in first edition is, of course, resolving collisions. And as the game grew and got more competitive and more serious, it became harder and harder to really accurately model that kind of thing. So these are, these are dual purpose. They help you with the barrel rolls. They also help you resolve collisions. But to barrel roll, you, same as ever, but you put it in the middle to start with. And then you can put it into one of three defined positions. You can put it middle to middle or you can line that hash mark up with the edge of the template. So you still get a little bit of wiggle room, but it's not nearly as powerful. And actually, if you want to grab one of those uh, medium ships, that's another, that's another addition to the game, and I can show you kind of how these barrel rolls work. So you are going to get a brand new base size, for starters, um, for the ships that didn't really fit comfortably on large or small bases. But uh, what this allows us to do is if you're barrel rolling a medium ship, you turn the template on its side, hash mark to hash mark, and then you can adjust it that much. You line the hash mark up with the middle, top, or bottom. And on large ships, this is even more of a dramatic curtailing of the barrel roll. So it's just, it's more balanced. You're getting less distance, you're getting less uh, power, and the, uh, the difference between a small ship barrel rolling and a large ship barrel rolling is way less significant in this edition. So I think that's a big improvement in terms of uh, how large ships function as well. Very cool. And so kind of wrapping up the uh, everything linked to the turret question, <laughs> I have, going back to the Y-Wing, I noticed on the couple changes with the upgrade cards. Yes. So they're full-size cards. Yep. Um, but they also have, you, you mentioned that it literally gives you an action on that card, which is something that we hadn't really seen. So tell me about uh, some of the changes to upgrades in X-Wing 2nd Edition. Yeah, well, one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to give ourselves enough switches to flip, levers to pull, design space for years and years and years to come. So what we were able to build right into 
the graphic design template is the ability to add actions, uh, upgrade actions from red to white, or add a red action specifically, um, add extra firing arcs. Like the, the upgrade card, Ion Cannon Turret's a really good example. Uh, a lot of stuff's going on. Um, we would not have been able to make this card in first edition. There wouldn't have been text space. There wouldn't have been enough uh, iconography. There wouldn't have been enough, this would have been like three or four different cards to try to bolt all these different mechanics on. Uh, but it adds the rotate arc action, which every turret pretty much that we've designed so far does. Um, it adds this turret arc. It and tells what, you how many dice you roll from that turret arc. Is the turret arc different than the primary arc they have? Yes. Yeah, so we have we have uh, the other thing we've done is is um, we've incorporated a lot of symbols into our text, uh, both for clarity and for uh, space saving reasons. So this little symbol, which looks exactly like this turret arc indicator, means add a turret arc. Cool. So the standard Y wing doesn't come with this little. Uh, Arc, right? right, exactly. Yeah. So the standard Y wing, um, you know, the the rebels would run it in a variety of different ways. So sometimes they would have the turret fixed into forward position. Sometimes they wouldn't have it at all. Sometimes it would pretty much be a bomber. Uh, but if you add this turret mechanic, you can then you know utilize this turret as a as a three sixty arc, um, and it also tells you you know what what does an ion turret do that's different from just a normal attack. So we have a ton of information on here, but it's easy to digest. And it's easy to get all that across on a single card. Sure. So that, that's really helpful. And then you can add a gunner too, which allows you to manipulate the turret arc in different ways, uh, maybe get a bonus attack, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of, there's, you can kind of uh, season it to taste. Do you want it really simple or do you want it to have all kinds of functionality? Cool. And so I also notice on like Iden Verso here, another mm -hmm. new addition, uh, which is this yellow token. I think yes. it's called a charge. Yep. So what's the deal behind a charge? I've, I've seen some upgrades that have the charge on it as well. Yeah, well, it's it's just, it's really, uh, again, it's very, very simple. Um, in first edition, we didn't have any way to really break things down into smaller segments. And that was one of the issues that we faced with ordnance, with missiles, torpedoes. They were all designed to be one-shot weapons. So they had to be incredibly powerful. Uh, this led to, you know, these alpha strikes that were just devastating because if they weren't strong enough, you, there'd be no reason to bring them. Um, so we were already kind of tackling this concept of charges in a indirect way with uh, extra munitions. Um, so it was really easy. It's, it's, like, it's, it's a lot easier to design a torpedo that has two charges and, and neither of them is, is so devastatingly powerful or a missile with three charges or that kind of thing uh, than it is to do something that is, is a one-shot. Or uh, in the case of like R2-D2, something that can happen again and again and again and, and be quite... Uh, quite powerful. So it's another means that we have of controlling the design. If we do regen, which we, we have, we've brought uh, regen back into the game, but if you look at R2-D2, you'll notice he's only got three charges. So you're never going to get more than three shields back during a game. You can't do it forever. Uh, the other thing that it lets us do is the concept of recurring charges. Uh, there are upgrades or abilities that we want to make once around or you know, once every three rounds or whatever we decide the balanced and interesting mechanic is, uh, we can control that through the concept of regenning a charge, just like you do with the force charges every round. I was going to say, I noticed this little arrow next to Vader's force stat. Yes, so that arrow indicates that it's a recurring charge. That means you recover one charge at the end of the round. So Vader can continue to use the force throughout the game. He starts with three charges, and if he uses all of those, he gets one back. If he doesn't use that, he gets another one back. So you can kind of build it back up. Um, but you'll always have at least one per round. And the same potentially works where the charge is. Yes, although uh, it also lets us control abilities that we want to be once per game or yeah. once per round. Um, Iden Versio has a really powerful ability, so it's just once per game. Once she's used it, it's done. Um, and so it's also, you know, an indicator. Like prior to this, if we had a once per game ability, there'd be no way to track it. You just have to remember that you did it. And that was a problem in competitive play. It was a problem in casual play if you forgot what you were doing. But we've got charges for everything now. So if, if it's once a round or once a game or three times a game, we can track all that stuff individually. Well, and it lets you track that without having to say once per game. Exactly. Yeah, and we it, don't have to say anything. And, and we can mark it. 
so that you can remember that it happened. And it's also potentially played off of other cards where you can mm -hmm. take someone's charge or you could give them a charge or yep. so on and so forth. So it seems like with everything you've changed, I mean, it's a, it's a whole system reboot, right? Yep. Uh, you've tightened the whole thing. And it, one of the other changes that I really like um, and I'd like to get your take on mm -hmm. is uh, I see Vader sitting here. He's a pilot skill six. In first edition of the game, he was pilot skill nine. Yep. Uh, so did he get worse or did the game change? <laughs> no, in a way he got better actually because another problem card that we removed from the game is uh, veteran instincts. Uh, manipulating, permanently manipulating your pilot skill via upgrade cards was another one of those elements of the game that was just really hard to control. You know, just by having that card in there that added two to everybody's pilot skill we had to factor that into our every design. It's like if we make a pilot skill 8, well, we've actually made a pilot skill 8 or 10. Um, so we didn't want to reintroduce that at all. Uh, pilot skill is now much more uh, precious and much more special. There's only a handful of, uh, and we, we changed the name to initiative as well because one of the other things that we wanted to get across is that this doesn't necessarily mean you're a better pilot. It just means your reflexes are faster. Your initiative is higher. Uh, in the case of Vader, obviously, he's both. He's got amazing reflexes. He's got an amazing pilot ability. He's got the force. He's a heavy hitter. Kind of a monster. Yeah, he's kind of a monster. But just because you have a high initiative doesn't necessarily mean you're the best pilot in the galaxy. Uh, so we changed the name, and we also compressed it a little bit. We realized we didn't need nine different brackets. Uh, it was too many. There was this sort of uh, twilight zone in the middle where it didn't really matter if you were pilot skill four or six. It, it was kind of irrelevant at a certain point. So by compressing that, not only have we made squads a little bit easier to build because you'll have um, allies that are the same initiative and easier to fly a lot more frequently, but you'll also have um, less of that weird, like, well, I've got a pilot skill four guy and a pilot skill six guy, but 90% of the time it doesn't matter. They're both going to go ahead of the, the scrubs and after, or, or, and, or after the scrubs and ahead of the really elite guys. So it's a small change, but it, it helps streamline the game. Very cool. Um, and so speaking of streamlining, one of the things I've noticed too is uh, a change to the tokens of the game. Yep. Um, and I think this is, you know, looking at streamlining the pilot skills, I, I like the idea of making it easier to manage your squads and, and mm -hmm. flying together. Uh, what's changed about the tokens? Yeah, so this is just a, a simple, uh, simple color-coded system um, and shape-coded system. Essentially, uh, we kind of organize tokens into different um, ideas. You know, green tokens are helpful. Uh, they improve your uh, performance, and they go away at the end of the round. Uh, red tokens are unhelpful. Um, they are negative effects, you know, you've got Stress. an ion token there, you've got uh, a critical hit token, which is, is permanent, uh, you've got stress. Um, to remove a red token requires a specific defined game event. Um, and then we've got yellow tokens. Yellow tokens are like green tokens, they go away at the end of the round, but they're a negative effect. Um, so you've got, you've got a disarm token there, um, jam tokens, tractor tokens, uh, various negative effects that persist for one round and then go away. So you can tell, uh, yeah, uh, exactly, you can tell at a glance with those orange tokens, you know, okay, I've got this negative effect, I have to remember that for this round, but at the end of the round, you can very easily say, okay, all the green tokens, all the orange tokens, they're going away. So it's, it's again, it's a subtle little thing, but it's a nice visual reminder of uh, when the timing of these effects occur, which is pretty cool. And then the other thing that we did is that all of the uh, markers the shield markers, the force markers, the charge markers, that kind of thing, um, that uh, stays on your cards. And those are flipped instead of removed. So you lose a shield, you flip it over to its uh, burned out side. You spend a force charge, you flipped it over to its used side. And so you're never taking those, those tokens out of the play area and putting them back in. You can keep track of not only uh, your current status, but also the, the status that you started on. So if you look down, you're like, okay, well, I've got a, a, a Y-Wing here. I've burned through two shields because those are red, and I have one uh, whole point of damage. You can see not only where you're at, but also where you started. Um, so it's a good reminder. And then target locks are also red tokens, and we've got that on the border there. So you know that those persist until they're removed by some effect. Um, and the, <laughs> the thing about target locks that I'm super excited about 
is that the blue ones are just gone. They're just <laughs> they're just gone. There's no more leaving those behind. There's no more forgetting, you know, which of three different paired target locks you have. They're all keyed to the ID token. So you see there you've got the uh, the number one, uh, two and three on your on your fighters in black. So if Vader gets a target lock, it's super easy. You just take this token, make sure it's on the right side to match his ID token black, and you put it by the ship that you're locking. So we've taken a double token set and we've reduced it to a single token that you can easily tie to exactly who got that lock. So it's way easier to keep track of. They're a little bit smaller. And again, they're in red so that you remember these don't go away at the end of the round. They only go away when they're when they're triggered or spent. Very cool. And so, you know, it seems like, again, you just keep streamlining every turn. You even removed an entire lock token. Um, we've also added uh, a token. Yes. Calculate. How does, how does this work? <laughs> Tell me more. Why, well, why, was it, why does it exist? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. We had a lot of different ideas for how to use this. We wanted to um, differentiate organic pilots, humans, uh, aliens, sentients, essentially, um, from droids. Because that's a big part of Star Wars lore, you know, um, the idea of the, the Clone Wars droid armies being uh, mass-produced and dangerous in numbers, but on an individual level inferior to human pilots or, or alien pilots or what have you. Um, so we wanted to get across the idea that droid pilots were fundamentally different. Uh, not necessarily better or worse, but different. And so we had a bunch of different ideas. Uh, for a while, the, the Calculate token was a persistent token, so it would remain for the entire round. And it wasn't spent. It would simply allow you to change. I mean, anytime you had a roll, you could change one focus result into, uh, uh, in, into either a hit or, a, or an evade or, or what have you. But that actually turned out to be way too powerful. <laughs> Uh, so we did a lot of different things, and we finally just landed on the idea that it's just it's just lousy focus. It's sure. it's not anything more complicated than that. It's a focus token that only lets you change one focus result instead of all focus results on offense or defense. On offense or defense, so it's just worse. But the really cool thing that that lets us do is it lets us play around with something that's more granular. So you can give ships multiple calculate tokens. You can do stuff like letting them share calculate tokens or spending their, their allies calculate tokens. It's a worse token, so it's more flexible and it gives us a lot more design space. Sure, so, it's a whole new uh, element of the game. Yeah, exactly. We haven't done a lot of it in the Wave 1 stuff. There's, a, there's calculate in a couple of different places, most notably probably uh, IG-2000, the IG-88s. Awesome. Have, um, they have calculate and then they have this ship ability called uh, advanced droid brain. So when they calculate, they get two tokens, which lets them sort of use it on offense and defense if they mm. want to, or you know, save it uh, and, and make it more granular. So it's future design space more than anything else, but it's another lever we can pull and, and another fun thing we can play around with. Very cool. Now, a, a lot of a ship, you obviously upgraded all the pilot abilities and the point costs are gone, the upgrade slots are different, and all the upgrades are changing mm -hmm. um, or you know, being slightly modified. Um, but a big part of what makes a ship a ship is its capacity to maneuver. Yes. So I see here some very new looking, both yes. uh, design-wise dials, and you know, as this is the TIE Advanced dial, and I notice mm -hmm. a one forward, which I'm happy about. <laughs> um, but tell me about the dials. Like, how, how big of a change uh, are we seeing here, and what's, is there anything different or new here? Yeah, well, uh, the, the first change to kind of go over is just a presentation change. Um, you'll notice that the new punch board dials function very much like our premium dials. Uh, one of the advantages to having those premium plastic dials was that you could see all of your maneuvers at once when you're selecting. Uh, you didn't have to cycle through each maneuver uh, past a little window, remember what your dial was, or you had a dial chart that you could reference. But now you can just look at your dial, you can see every single maneuver that it's possible for you to do, and then you can select one. And that alone is just very, very useful. Um, so presentation-wise, that's a big improvement, I think. Um, and then in terms of what did we do in second edition to uh, the actual maneuvering capabilities of ships, well, the great thing is that we had, again, you know, five plus years of game to draw on. So uh, one of the things that, you know, was part of the 
issue with older ships in, in first edition is they didn't have access to some of the cooler maneuvers um, that they might otherwise have had. Like, we didn't come up with the Talon roll until wave eight or nine. We didn't come up with the Segnor's loop until wave five. So any ship before that wave wouldn't have that ability at all, even if it should. So because we had all this stuff to draw on, because we had experimented with all these different maneuvers, we added pretty much all of the, uh, you know, varieties of special maneuver to the game at this point that we are, that we are likely to do. Um, we were able to comprehensively look at every single ship style and tweak it. Uh, we also knew which styles were not good enough, which styles were too good. Uh, you know, competitively, the X-Wing dial got a lot more interesting. It got a lot more green maneuvers. It got Talon rolls. It got, you know, uh, it's just a more fun and interesting ship to fly. It got a barrel roll. Uh, so that's important. When we were trying to come up with the identity for every ship, we were able to say, you know, well, what, what should this ship be able to do that it wasn't able to do in first edition? Or, you know, did we get a little generous? too generous with this ship's capabilities in first edition. Do we want to pare it back a little bit? The only dial in the game, I think, that hasn't changed at all is the TIE Fighter. <laughs> the, the baseline. Tie, the, the TIE Fighter is exactly the same in second edition as it was in first edition. That's awesome. Which is a little bit of just, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a shark. It doesn't really need to evolve. The game needed to evolve um, in order for the TIE Fighter to remain relevant. But the TIE Fighter itself, it's got a pretty good dial for a little ship, but it's not a great dial. It's got, uh, a, you know, a, a pretty decent stat line, but it's not a great stat line, and it's cheap. So it, it kind of was everything you think of when you think of a TIE Fighter. It already worked. So we were able to use that as sort of a template and kind of design around it. it didn't need to get anything new because it was pretty much a, a great representation of, of what a TIE Fighter is already. Sure, it was kind of the North Star. Yep, but the yeah. TIE Advanced had a really miserable dial, and it was hard to fly, and it didn't really feel like an elite ship. We didn't want to change it too much, but we gave it a one straight. Uh, we gave it Talon Rolls. Uh, we gave it more green maneuvers. It's just a more interesting ship now. And that actually brings me to another change, which mm -hmm. is there are no longer green maneuvers. Right, that's true. They're blue maneuvers. You, you, you caught me out. I'm still thinking with my old school brain. Yeah, and that's just, a, that's just for colorblindness. Um, Red-green is a common affliction. Um, a lot of people struggle with identifying that, and particularly when it's so crucial to X-Wing. Uh, when we became aware of that issue, uh, it was a no-brainer to just solve that and make it a little bit easier for people who have that disability. So we're really happy that we were able to to do that for all of our players as well. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so the final major change is the damage deck. Tell me what's changed in second edition. Well, we wanted to create one definitive damage deck that could last for the life of this game so that everybody's on the same page, um, everybody's got the same probabilities, uh, and we took a, a look at what worked and what didn't work in uh, first edition damage deck. And, you know, one of my concerns with the original damage deck was that not every critical hit even had an effect. Sometimes you'd have a card that did absolutely nothing um, to one ship, uh, but it was devastating to another ship just based on what you built. Like if you had an elite pilot talent or not, if you had uh, a secondary weapon or not. And that I felt like was was even more, I mean, it's it's supposed to be random. It's supposed to be variable. That's part of the fun. You're not sure what you're going to get. But it should have an effect on every ship that draws a critical. There shouldn't be any freebies. And there also shouldn't be any cards in there that are extraordinarily bad to receive, um, other than sort of the direct hits, which is just extra damage. Um, but Blinded Pilot was just a miserable card to get. Because you lost an entire attack. And it could come at a critical moment. It could really it could cost you the game. And more importantly, it could cost you the fun of rolling dice and, and seeing what would happen. So we just, we kind of, um, we, we took all of the stuff that we liked and we kept it. And the cards that we didn't like, we replaced. Uh, so every single card in this deck will do something to you if you receive it. And it is, it's, it's more fair and it's more fun. And we can do abilities like Kylo Ren or Merrick Steele and they'll have a significant effect, 
but they can't necessarily like, you know, double blind a pilot and keep it out of the game for most of the game. So we just feel like it's a it's a, a simpler, more more uh, fair and more fun damage deck. And so we're just happy that we were able to, to tweak that as well. And I also noticed they, they seem numbered and then on each one there's a number of pips. Yeah, yeah, so that's just a, a nice reference for players. Um, damage deck is 33 cards, and so you can easily check if you put them all in order that you have every card. And it also shows you how many copies of that card are in the deck. So there's two loose stabilizers. There's five direct hits. Um, that's the other thing, we took down the number of direct hits from seven to five to make it a little bit less common. Um, but we added this kind of um, maybe direct hit. We added, uh, we added four of these fuel leaks. And this is a direct hit in waiting. It's, uh, <laughs> when it grows up, it's gonna be a direct hit. Basically, this goes on your card, and after you suffer a critical damage, your fuel catches on fire and you take an additional damage card. But it's an action to repair it. So you have, again, you've got that, that choice. Do I, do I spend my action solving this issue or do I just let it ride, hope that I don't take another critical, take a focus or a target lock or whatever other crucial action I want to take. So that's kind of a fun, you know, uh, harbinger of doom that sits on your ship and, and makes you makes you think about it. Makes it. I mean, and choices are what makes makes games like this great, right? Exactly. Having to choose yeah. and make the hard choices. So we've been talking a lot about the specific changes to X-Wing, and mm -hmm. there's a ton. I mean, like we said, this is a kind of whole system mm -hmm. tightening, cleanup, removal, uh, reining in from pilot skill to damage decks to the pilots themselves. So on a macro level, though, um, you know, the first people that played the first edition or even people at this point that haven't played, um, holistically, what has really changed about X-Wing and what kind of experience should uh, veteran players expect? That's a really good question. I like to think that X-Wing is truer to its original spirit than it ever has been. Um, that is certainly our intent. We love this game. And what we love about this game is the maneuvering, the guessing, the flying, um, out thinking your opponent, uh, every single round having to make new decisions and analyze the game state, play by play, think on your feet, your plans will change. Um, your, your firing arcs are crucial, your dials are crucial. And so every single thing that we did in second edition was an attempt to hone in on that spirit of the game and really, really try to emphasize that. That's why we did the mobile firing arc instead of the 360 arc. That's why we've done things like the bullseye arc, which re reward not just getting you in your firing arc, but getting you in that bullseye. Um, so we really believe that this is more X-Wing than it ever has been. It's more true to the original intent of the game. Um, and we also didn't want to throw people, uh, we've gone over a ton of changes here, but I think that you will find, if you are a fan of the existing game, these are really easy to synthesize. They're refinements, they're not sea changes. This is still the same exact game that you know and love. You're plotting your dials, you're rolling your dice. We've just tried to cut the tall poppies down the excessive offense, the excessive defense, the 360 degree firing arc, which lets you ignore key elements of the game. So it's really our sincere hope and belief that this is going to feel more pure as an experience than the um, sort of late stage first edition game. So we're just super excited about it. It feels, still feels like X-Wing, it still plays like X-Wing, and if anything, it's more true to its original spirit. Awesome. Well, Alex, thank you so much for coming on and explaining all this. Uh, if you're watching and you actually want to see all of this in action, Alex and I will be playing a game of second edition that you can watch. Uh, and until then, keep playing. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video or any of our other X-Wing videos, those are literally made possible by orders from our store. So all second edition products are there. They're shipping for free and we have faction specific subscriptions where we'll send you all of your favorite faction ships as soon as they release. And be sure to head over to the blog where we have all of the information you can possibly want about X-Wing 2nd Edition all in one place, and we'll catch you on the next video.